Good morning, church. Today is the fifth Sunday of August. Hard to believe, but we are here. But back in the, you know, before times, when things were more old precedented, we used to do things a little differently on these days. A fifth Sunday would be a koinonia Sunday, which is the Greek word for fellowship. And on these days, instead of the rows, we would move the chairs around tables where we would have a special communion service. I was more uh, communal than we typically do. And that layout worked out great because on those days, we usually had a potluck, which I have nothing else to say about at all. We had a, pot, we had a potluck. We're not today. There will come a day when we'll do that all again. Lord, may it come soon. I said it. Okay. But on those days, instead of a sermon, I would take the opportunity to interview people in our church about their life experiences. And I have interviewed families, ministry leaders, elders, missionaries, and others about how they have seen God at work. And I have missed doing this. You hear so much from me. I like to hear from you. And, and I want you to hear from you. So we're going back to that practice, and today I want to interview some of the hardest working people in our congregation, and that is our teachers and educators. We have a number of people at our church that teach from elementary up to college. Now, we know this. Being a teacher has never been easy, and yet teachers work long and hard for the benefit of our young people. And their work often doesn't finish when they leave the classroom, but continues on at home with grading and lesson prep and other things that they need to do. And often, they pay for supplies out of their own pocket. So, you know, it's a good thing that teachers are abundantly compensated, right? <laughs> Laughter from the teachers. <laughs> but thank God for their hard work. If I were to ask you about your favorite teacher, everyone would have an answer, no matter how long ago it was that you last stepped foot in a classroom. Teachers don't just educate us. They inspire us. And so, as we uh, recognize that being a teacher has always been difficult, throw a global pandemic into the mix. Now, all of us have been made to make, we've had to make changes over the last several months, but that includes our schools and our teachers. You know, I remember that fateful day in March 2020 when I picked my son up for, from school for the last time, though we didn't know it. You know, it was just a Thursday. But the, that coronavirus thing that had been in the news had uh, made its way to Michigan and, um, uh, so as precaution, school was going to be canceled for one day. You know, that Friday, you know, it was spring break would start early. But then spring break never unbroke. And schools had to very quickly figure out how to change all of their plans and adapt to a virtual classroom. When all while it seemed like the world around us was coming to an end. Now, as we know, the world didn't end then, despite all the uncertainty of that spring. And over that summer break, educators had a little time to make some more solid plans. Uh, some teachers would teach entirely virtually over Zoom, while others did a hybrid between in-person and virtual. And some went back and forth, back and forth. You know, my son did kindergarten virtually, um, and his teacher was outstanding. But I knew it wasn't easy. And I know because I was often there in the classroom that was his bedroom. Uh, just imagine having 25 five and six year olds on Zoom and trying to teach them how to read. But somehow she did. So this coming school year uh, is going to be a little different still, but hopefully a little more normal. Uh, both of my kids are returning to in-person school, and for the most part, we're looking forward to it. The Livonia Public Schools has expressed their hope that this would be a bridge year, back to the way things were pre-pandemic, 
Still having COVID mitigation strategies and safety measures, though not as many as last year. Because we're not normal yet. And that fact is frustrating, it is disappointing, it is exhausting, it's, it, it's all of those things. Now, many people here have children or grandchildren in school, and they know how it's been like. But I want to invite the teachers to join me on stage so that we can hear from them, because they have been on the front lines this whole time. And I, I sent them my questions ahead of time, which some responded to online, uh, so I'll be reading their responses. But uh, a few others, you can make your way. I got, about, I think, four teachers who are going to be joining me on stage, and afterwards, we'll pray a prayer of blessing upon them and their students. So if you want to come up here and join me, I'll even get you these comfy chairs. So I guess we'll make our way this way. Um, just tell us who you are, what you teach, or where you teach, and tell us your experiences. Start off over here. Um, my name is Paul Jacobs. Um, I used to teach 7th and 8th grade social studies um, for eight years, but in two days I'll be teaching 6th grade social studies for the first time um, at a new school in Hazel Park. So that'll be fun. Um, <laughs> I know absolutely no one there, so I have two days to get ready and teach. Um, uh, so during the pandemic, teaching uh, was very difficult. Um, I, the school I taught at was a charter school in Southfield. All of our students are from Detroit. Um, none of them had technology, none of them had anything at all. So we gave them all laptops, all hotspots, and I had about 150 students on Zoom, and I probably saw 10 of them. Um, like, who would they look like? Uh, they never turned on their cameras. They were um, embarrassed at their home lives and where they come from. School was their escape from that. Um, they all wore uniforms at school, so they all looked the same. Didn't matter their background or where they... Um, who their parents were, but at home, they did not want to show what they had there. Um, so it's very difficult attempting to reach out to any student and get them to do anything at all. Uh, so it is very difficult. We went back to hybrid in the year around February, March, and I got maybe 20 kids in person, and then those kids had showed a massive improvement, but the rest of them who were on Zoom never really did anything much at all. So it was, it was very difficult. Hi, I'm Carolyn Miller. Um, I teach Jobs for America's Graduates, which um, I talk about all the time, but it's basically like adulting 101, like trying to teach people how to survive in the real world when you graduate high school with jobs, careers, etc. Everything he said was true, except we had Microsoft Teams, which we find out we were using like four days before school started, so you can teach an old dog new tricks. You can, because I learned. We never went back in person. We were always virtual, and I had to develop relationships with all the seniors or the ones that fit my criteria, like who really wanted to be in JAG, because I follow up with them for a whole year. So kids I've never met, I had to develop relationships with that they'll answer the phone with me for the following year. And because of prayer, so far they've all been answering the phone and, and seeing me, and I did do a lot of drive-by, um, driveway meetings, <clears throat> but... Um, same thing, the students would come off mute, and it was like hell reigneth, you know? It was just a lot, like they'd be babysitting four or five kids, or even one or two while they were trying to be in school, sitting in their bed in the dark, because that's the only place that they had to study from. So if they came, they didn't come off camera, but coming off mute, they didn't want to do that either. I didn't want them all to. 30 kids in a class, and they come off mute, there's no way anything could have happened. So it was very... Very different, for sure. Um, I'm Shannon Williams, and I taught, last year I taught Spanish for kindergarten through fifth grade students. I was in an elementary school setting, which is a little bit different. Ironically, very similar situations. Um, we did not go back in person until about March, so up until that point we were using Zoom or Google Meet, and it was kind of all over the place trying to figure out um, what worked best for each teacher. And then we as specialist teachers in some, some buildings, we uh, kept our regular schedule. In other buildings, we were only teaching in the afternoon. So then that cut down on our t amount of time to teach the students. So instead of seeing them every week, we maybe only saw them every other week. 
Um, and of those students and of those few times that we could see them, we only had 50% um, uh, or less that attended. They would be, uh, they would have their cameras off or they would be on mute. Um, sometimes I would call on a student that had their camera off just to kind of check in. Crickets, they didn't answer, like they had just come, turned it on and left. So it was really hard to know who you were reaching and who you were not reaching. Um, and then when we went back in March in a hybrid model, kind of um, similar to what Paul said, like definitely some students made some great gains, but again, we didn't have consistent attendance from the students that came. They were only coming two days a week, and um, it was just a very unusual situation, very difficult. I'm Julie Adams. I teach seventh grade health and phys ed, and last year I taught computers. Virtually, <laughs> it was interesting. Um, I typed mine up and I'm gonna read it because it's very similar to a lot of things that they said. Um, but I said, in Livonia, we started off remote, then we went in person, we went back to remote, then second semester we were in person. Uh, we didn't do the hybrid model, but I taught some days virtually and some days in person because we had Livonia virtual last year, so that was confusing and it was different times. So there was these times for in-person and this, and I always got there on time, I don't know how, but I did. Um, I feel like most people, parents, students, and staff felt one extreme way or the other about the virus, mass, online learning, et cetera. So this made it very difficult to empathize, understand, help, or please our students and their families. Um, teachers had to learn a whole new way to teach and kids had to figure out how to learn from home, online, with spotty Wi-Fi, sharing computers, babysitting their siblings, distractions from siblings or other family members who are working from home. Um, and I mean, there was one student I was trying to get a hold of and finally he came back and he was like, oh, I was chasing down the UPS man because they delivered the wrong package to us. And I was like, <laughs> okay. I mean, what do you say to that? I don't know. Um, I also just put on here, and maybe this could be at the end, but um, I don't want people to think that we think that teachers are the only ones that had it rough. Um, obviously, everyone struggled during this time, but it was just so difficult, I think, because we were working with kids that they had so many challenges that they had to deal with that, um, I mean, I had a student that just never came, and then I found out she has to babysit all of her siblings. And it's like, you know, how are they supposed to learn? So it was, it was just really challenging. Uh, I've got a few uh, written responses that were uh, submitted to me. Uh, Amanda Jacobs, uh, Paul's, uh, uh, Paul's wife, also a teacher, and she uh, said it was really, really tough. All of a sudden, our whole system just flipped upside down. I was learning how to use all this technology, which I was not confident in, and all in about two weeks so that students wouldn't miss out on learning. Wearing masks has been different as well as the technology piece. Both have been a challenge. I, I think one of the biggest challenges for me was not being able to hug my students or give them high fives. I work with younger students who love hugs and need that contact with their teachers. Um, and then her dad, Michael French, it's a family of teachers, um, said that he's a, a school librarian, and he said that my district decided that checking out library books was too risky, so I worked as a reading interventionist, helping small groups of students with their reading. It was all online until February, and I faced the challenge of doing something new and getting back into something earlier, uh, into some earlier teaching skills that I hadn't used in a long time, while also using uh, learning new programs and how to work with kids over Zoom. Uh, Heather Brubaker, elementary school teacher, and she said that this past school year was a year like none other. It was mentally and physically exhausting. As a teacher, you are trained to be flexible and to be able to switch gears at a moment's notice, but this year took that to a whole other level. From going remote to in-person, then back to remote, and finally back in-person was a huge challenge. It was also a challenge to teach my students that were in the classroom and also teach the students who were in quarantine. And finally, Andrea Moyer, who's uh, Dr. Moyer, who's a professor of uh, biology at Oakland University, um, said, during the pandemic, I participated in online teaching. This was different in both good and bad ways. One of the advantages was that we were offered training opportunities to improve the quality of online instruction, and this greatly improved my delivery of online lectures and materials. One of the disadvantages was that students were overwhelmed by spending many hours online for preparation, lectures, studying, and exams. 
the lack of social connections and a variety of on-screen learning opportunities was exhausting for some. And I faced the challenge of keeping those students motivated, engaged, and connected while supporting them academically and personally. So this kind of rolls in to our, our next question, which is, what challenges have you overcome? Um, you know, we, we know that you, you have faced a lot of these things, but what, what have you overcome and what has helped you in, in doing this? So we can make our way down this way. Okay. Julie? Technology. Technology, technology. We had to learn it. We didn't have any other option. We had to learn it. We had to learn either Zoom. We started, we did Google Meet just, just during um, conferences. So we had conferences virtually, which was a whole new thing, and setting that up, and it was a whole new thing for the district. And so this, the fall conferences were a little bit of a disaster because they couldn't find our certain links, but then they fixed it for, for the spring. But um, Google Classroom and all that, um, just technology, just learning new ways to get the information to them and to get my hard copy books to them virtually and Google Forms and just all that kind of stuff. And how did I overcome it? Um, my teacher friends um, at church, at school, online, um, anybody that could help me with technology, that's how I overcame it. What else is there to say? <laughs> <clears throat> I, um, because when you have, and I think you know too, when you're in an elective class, um, it's harder too because the kids are not as, they were told to focus on their academics. And so my class was like viewed as, a, I'll get there when I get there. We were told to not give more than two assignments a week um, and that two graded assignments a week. So I started doing stuff like if I had, I had a lot of speakers come in. So, um, because, you know, I had like doctors, I had nurses, and I had different people, skilled trades people come in. And I would give them, if you show up, if you just show up, <laughs> you get points. If you show your face, you get more points. If you ask a question, you get more points. Um, trying to find ways to engage them or to give them good grades because most of them were, like I said, they show up, half the kids, if you were lucky, showed up in a given day and trying to get them to do any kind of assignment. I would literally have a day when I'd say, I'm going to go over this assignment. If you turn it in today, I'll give you extra points for turning it in today. Tomorrow I'll go over the answers. If you turn in the work tomorrow, after I go over the answers, I'll give you the points I'll give you the points. They still didn't turn the work in. So trying to find a way to make sure that they all pass, because you're not going to flunk a kid. You're just not going to flunk a kid in this thing. You couldn't, um, unless they never showed up. Um, but um, what I wrote was um, having to learn an entirely new way to teach. And every week, they would add something to Microsoft Teams. They'd add a new technology that you had to learn on the spot. Aren't you using, aren't you using this one? Well, why don't you use this? And you're like, because I like know too much already. <sighs> oh my gosh. Um, hard, it was hard to, had to develop relationship with students that didn't interact, talk, or show their faces. One-on-one -on -one communication helped best, virtual chats and breakout rooms. Not getting upset with them and not taking it personally because it wasn't my fault. They weren't mad at mm -hmm. me. They were upset because they were in really crappy environments and they didn't want to be at home. They didn't want to be there and they were stuck in a really bad place. And the one place they could go for safety, they couldn't go to anymore. Mm. Um, the first challenge overcame was when we first started online in March, uh, I got a lot of kids doing stuff. And then our school sent a letter saying, you're all gonna pass no matter what. And so that was real fun because then I saw none of them anymore, and they just stopped and everything. But then the next year, they told them that like this all matters. And the problem I ran into in the challenge is, I, in eighth grade, I do all project-based learning and all hands-on and group work stuff, and I don't do anything online at all. And so I had to completely revise everything and make something new up that was still fun and interact and, uh, interacting with the students. So that was that was the biggest challenge I overcame was completely switching my entire way I teach. Um, what helped was talking to the students really about like what what's helping you and do I need to slow down? Am I going too fast? Like I go through an entire lesson step by step, tell them everything to type in, say submit, 
and then I would get five out of 25 turned in. I'd be like, what, what happened? Did you not do anything? And they didn't. And so like just slowing down and not going as fast is what, what helped me a lot. Um, <clears throat> Amanda shared on this question uh, that the biggest challenges, like reiterating, was technology, teaching my students how to work everything, and slowing things down, going step by step, has great, helped greatly with teaching the kids and staff about how to use different technology. And by the end of the year, I had kindergarten students present their screens and show me their work over a laptop. And it was pretty cool to see all these new technology skills that they were learning. Um, Michael shared that he had to learn to be more flexible and to expect the unexpected, find ways to connect and engage students on the computer and keep their attention while they work from home while there were other distractions. And it helped to know that I was not alone. Other co-workers and family were doing the same thing and can share the ups and downs together. Uh, Heather shared that in the past, I have been a bit frightened when it comes to technology. And through this pandemic, it has forced me to use and be fluent with technology and new programs. And I can now say that I am confident in creating and running many different educational programs. But my students also had to overcome the challenges of technology. And I was blown away how easily they learned how to get on for our Zoom classes, how they helped others during our live sessions who were having trouble with volume or their connection. Never did I think seven- and eight-year-old students can learn to create PowerPoints, take pictures of work, and then upload them into an assignment, or learn how to use Flipgrid, which allowed them to take a video of their assignments and then send it to me. Some say that so much learning was lost during this pandemic, but look at what these students have learned to do using technology. My students also learned to build their own digital book libraries so that they had, to ac had access to their books at their reading level since they could not check out and take home books from our classroom library. And Andrea shares that I have overcome some techno technical challenges learning how to use software and create a format for online learning that caters to the needs of the students. And I definitely think that having technology has been a blessing. I have also found it challenging to really engage students in a fully online class. I started a session outside of class called Coffee and COVID, where students could meet on Zoom and talk casually about their questions and concerns during the pandemic. And I found that giving them a space to connect with myself and each other allowed them to have a safe space for discussion and community that they needed. And this seemed to result in an improved academic performance as well. So this, so we're hearing from them, their experiences, and, and the challenges of the last couple of years. But this, this question I want to ask them next is, how have you seen God at work through all this? Paul, you got the microphone. <laughs> it's weird as for being a teacher, I hate talking to people. So this is, <laughs> this is very hard for me. I don't mind talking to my students because I'm in charge. But <laughs> in front of people, it's, yeah. Um, I don't know, I guess, I guess seeing what their home lives has been like for my students, and because uh, I never really bring their homes to my to school, and so seeing, seeing their homes and understanding more of where they came from, um, I guess I saw God work more through me of understanding my students better of what they're dealing with and what they're going through, and understanding how their brains work and the home lives and situations I come from. Like, I had one girl, she never muted her mic and had her camera on, but she had that beeping sound from the smoke detector going every 30 seconds off and it and beep, and we're like <laughs> and we and be like you, you need you need to, to, to mute or fix your smoke detector she goes it's not on my end it's yours i'm like no it's not my smoke i don't have a smoke <laughs> detector here but she was so used to that beeping in their house for years because that's just how she lived that she didn't even notice it was going off anymore but to all of us it was the most annoying sound in the world <laughs> but like we i understand more of what what they deal with every single day and i get like the babysitting kids or Kids telling me, oh, Mr. Jacobs, I have to go. I'm like, what are you doing? I have to go mow the lawn. I'm like, no, you're not. You're in school right now. I'm like, put your mom on so I can talk to her. And understanding more of how they, what every single day, the situations they deal with, I, I guess that's the best way I saw God work through me. One thing I hadn't actually written down, but I've really thought about it, is that the teachers at my school, like, we bonded. We had a group me, um, we have one for just all the staff at Pershing, and then one for, which I'm not like a DPS teacher, I don't get the union stuff, I don't get the hazard pay, I don't get, I'm nonprofit, but they never treat me like that. So we have these group meets just for the senior teachers where we literally were like, have you seen this kid? What's going on with this one? Where we were, it was our lounge, but virtually, and we just would 
help each other and be there for each other. And that was pray for each other. That was huge. And the big thing is, yeah, the compassion, being able to praying for these kids, finding out more about what their real lives are like, because it's true. When they come to school, you don't always know that they've got four siblings at home that whenever they come home, they're automatically responsible for. You don't understand that. Their parents, I have parents who are literally, you could hear the parents in the background cussing and screaming while their kids, they know their kids are in school. What are you doing? And just praying for them and having compassion. And I guess I cannot believe that those 32 follow-up kids that I have, that I'm following up with the next year, that I'm able to, that they're answering the phone, that we develop the relationships. And in some cases, I think I developed better relationships than I would have if they were in person because I did a lot of one-on-ones and coming to, I would come to their house and they'd be waiting in the driveway to see me. They were so excited. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm such a mess today, but they were so excited to see me. They'd be in the driveway, like with their masks on. And um, it's just, cause like I said, we never went back in person. Just that's, I just feel like God was working through this. God was hopefully working in me. And I felt like the kids knew that they were loved by me and that they needed that so much right now. And that just, Trying to be consistent and not let myself get stressed out or angry with them was just a huge thing for them. I, I would keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a specialist teacher in the elementary school, I see over 700 students a week. And I was very concerned. Um, as Carolyn said, specialist teachers are not necessarily the priority. And I felt very... Um, unprotected, so to speak, unadvocated for when we were looking at going back to school. And the possibility of not only me being exposed to 700 plus students, um, you know, what possibly my children were gonna be exposed to and how many, I mean, that just was exponential and so overwhelming. Um, for me, and this is very personal because every school district handled things differently, my children had the option of being virtual which took a lot off um, of, of our plate before the vaccine came out, et cetera. And then my school district decided to be virtual. And like I said before, we didn't go back until March. And I think for myself um, and with my concerns with some health issues at home in our family, that was such a huge deal for me to see how God worked in that situation and, um, and intervened. And even when we went back, my school went back as hybrid. So they were max 15 students per class and we were still um, virtual on Wednesdays. So even when we went back, it greatly reduced the amount of students that I was exposed to. I would echo what Paul said too. Um, it was very, very eye-opening to see the backgrounds and what the children are dealing with at home. And again, um, you know, you have a big mix in a school district, but I work in a school district where the kids tend to be a little bit more needy, so to speak. Um, it, was, it was astounding, some of the things that went on in the background when the, the, the uh, microphones were unmuted and they didn't realize it. And I think as a teacher, you, you do have compassion and you're there for a reason, but I just think that in this situation, God, had opened my eyes to an even bigger picture and a bigger need. And it helped me realize how important what I do is mm. to Amen. some of these kids. Amen. Yes, to all of that. But I'm gonna say one thing that I did write on advance. I put, how did I see God working through all this, that God is in control. Mm -hmm. um, I said, when I felt overwhelmed, I prayed, I prayed probably more this past school year than ever. I said, I cried a lot too, but I prayed. <laughs> um, I could feel God with me and it helped me so much and I'm stronger because I relied on him and not myself. Amen. Uh, Amanda shared that she was pregnant with Emerson during part of this past school year and was very afraid of going uh, into school. But God has kept me and our family safe from COVID so far. We are a two-teacher household, so Paul and I bring home all kinds of kid germs on a daily basis. And I always worry about what I could be bringing home to our kids, but I was even more worried with COVID. But God has protected our family during this time. And, and, and Michael reiterated that God has seen us through so far and continues to do so. He has helped my family stay well and healthy and helped me persevere through the challenges. 
Heather has seen God work through all of this, saying, I have been amazed with my students and how easily most of them adapted to constant change. This past year, my students were with each other all day long without any breaks from each other. They had to eat in our classroom, so there was no sitting with other friends to get away from those in their classroom. They had to play at recess with only the kiddos in their class. They couldn't play with other friends in other classrooms. And I know that with my own children being together for so long, they needed a break for each other, from each other. Um, my students never let it get to them. They grew closer together and never seemed to get sick of each other. And as a staff, we bounded in a way that couldn't be explained. We were in a battle together and had to rely on and look to each other for help and support. We became a family. And I don't think this would have been as easy if it weren't for knowing, for God knowing we would need that closeness this year. And Andrea said, yes, I think that God has been at work prompting growth in each of us during this time. I have personally appreciated reflecting on God's understanding of our need for community. I have seen both students and faculty approach each other with a new sense of compassion and empathy throughout this experience. I have seen students trying to support each other through positive and encouraging comments to each other in online forums, and I hope that these patterns continue into the future. So the last thing, uh, last question I have is, what are ways that we, we, as a community, can support our teachers and students during this time? So I said, um, please pray for us. Um, please be kind and supportive of your child's school and their staff. Please assume best intentions. We do this job because we care about your kids. Um, we make mistakes. Um, school districts may not implement every protocol um, that you may want them to, but everyone is doing their best, and best looks different to everyone. Mm -hmm. Those are some really great things. I like them. I started with pray. And then I also just said, um, especially again from the, I think I'm the lone elementary representative up here, our kids have a lot of gaps. They missed a lot of instruction. If you have time or opportunity to volunteer, that would be amazing. There are so many students that need some one-on-one -on -one help to catch up, to fill in some holes, to learn some things that they just didn't get. So that would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm what they said, um, pray. But a um, couple things, one is um, along the lines of what you are, not everybody's virtual experience was the same either. I think that most of the people here, if you have children who are in virtual school, almost certainly their virtual experience and learning was different than it might be in some of the other areas like Hazel Park or Detroit. So if you have the opportunity, like she said, to help in any way um, be it financially, be it tutoring, be it understanding and recognition, because I'm telling you right now that the kids that I teach, that was a dumpster fire of a year, and there's no getting around it. And they're coming, and some of these kids, if they're still coming to school this year, are going to go out into the real world and not have basic education that they really need. But um, also, you know, that meme I'm kind of sick of, about teachers are in it for the outcome, not the income. Well, we, we want income too. So yeah. <laughs> if, if you ever have the opportunity to recognize that teachers are not paid in the way that they should be, remembering that we're the ones who are teaching the doctors and everybody else out there in the world, um, keep that in mind, please. And if there's unkind memes on Facebook or social media, like shut that down. Thank you. Um, teachers are usually used to being told what you do and then you just do it and adapt to it. And um, I guess the best way to support us is, um, like, I got into this to teach and educate. I didn't get into it to, to make policy decisions or tell you how to best deal with health and everything. And so I think that the best way to support teachers is let them teach and stop making them choose how we're going to solve the health crisis and the pandemic and make us the scapegoats for all that. Make those who are in healthcare do that instead of uh, putting on the blame of teachers and everyone else. Like, 
so many board members are out there saying they got into this as school boards to, to help students, not to make uh, health choices for everybody. And I think that's the best way to support them is let's do the education and let the health care providers do what they need to do best. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Amanda shared uh, prayers for all of us teachers are wonderful. It is a stressful time with everyone having different opinions about what district's policies are. It's hard on us. Honestly, providing meals every once in a while can help too. Just to help take one thing off our plates for a night. Maybe we'll get a meal train going or uh, something. That's a great idea. Um, Michael says, keep praying for us. No matter which side of the issues you're on, remember that we're trying to do what's best for the kids and adults to keep them safe and healthy. Uh, teachers don't make the decisions. Please be kind and try to be understanding. Keep hanging in there. We'll get through this together. Heather shared, please continue to pray for us, our families, our students, staff, and administration this school year because we are still dealing with this pandemic. I'm sure there will still be many challenges and unknowns before the school year uh, begins again. And FYI, I also love large unsweetened iced tea from McDonald's. And Andrea shares, I think we have to remember that we are all in this together, that we're each doing the best that we can. We can be patient with the new technologies, learning curves, rules, transitions, etc. We also need to know that God provides us his peace. We can give each other gentle reminders of that as well as support each other by taking each other's prayers to the Father. I think that we need to remember that people have a huge spectrum of struggles during a pandemic. We all view the world a little bit differently. And our differences are beautiful and intentional in God's design. Instead of just seeing this experience through our own eyes, we can practice listening to others for understanding to promote perspective, growth, and unity. So on that, is there last thing, is anything you'd like to add? I just wanted to say thank you because um, the church has recognized us as teachers a couple of times and um, just given us a little, a little gift card, and that's just meant so much to know that we're in your thoughts and prayers, even if all of you didn't know that that was happening. It was really, really nice, so thank you. <laughs> Nothing I haven't already said. Just recognize that we're all... Working, we were already working hard, and we've been working harder, and this year is a little scary because we all think that we're going to go. I, my Detroit teachers think we're going to go back to school and stay till after count day in October and then be sent back home. That's what we think is going to happen, and we don't want that for our kids, but just nothing is more important than prayer, nothing right mm -hmm. now, and um, that's all. Amen. Thank you. On behalf of our congregation of Bath our community I want to express our appreciation and thanks for all that you do um, you have shared with us openly the challenges you face you've been vulnerable in your in your answers and uh, and we know that there are more challenges to come we hear you and we support you uh, we love you not just as teachers but as our brothers and sisters in Christ and we are grateful to the God that you have witnessed and testified is at work in our schools, in our classrooms, and, and in your lives. And we will continue praying for you. And I encourage those listening um, to consider ways uh, that you can demonstrate your support, not just now at the beginning of the school year, but throughout it, uh, helping these teachers to know that they are not alone. But let us pray. And I'll, you guys can be seated, and uh, Rick will lead us in our next song. But let us pray for our teachers, our students, and, and all those involved in our education system. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your loving care and protection and guidance. You have been with us thus far, and we know that you will be with us to the very end. Lord, we need your continued presence in our lives. And today we bring the administrators, principals, principals, professors, teachers, school secretaries, support staff, transportation, cafeteria, and maintenance staff of our schools before you. We pray for your blessings 
and in their classrooms, and in their hallways, and in their homes. Be with their students, and with their families. May they be empowered by your Holy Spirit to minister to their students, caring for them as they educate and inspire them. We pray also for the parents, guardians, and caregivers of all of our students, and may they too know that they are not alone. Father, gather their fears and frustrations into your arms. Help them to trust in you in the midst of the uncertainties and the risks. Give them your strength and courage as they continue to raise their children, especially in these times when it's really hard to be a parent. And Father, we pray for the students. Be with our children, no matter how old they are. They are learning so much about this world, both in their studies and in their life experiences. They are growing up in challenging times, but in the midst of them, may they grow in grace and wisdom and in love. Please protect them, dear Father keeping them safe from illness, but also from the stress and the social and mental and emotional toll that this pandemic has on them. And Lord, continue to be with your church. Help us to be a light in this community, reflecting the light that you have given us with your love. And may we continue to support each other in your love. May your spirit be upon us continuing the ministry of Jesus through us as we are his hands and his feet. Give us imaginations and creativity to come up with ways to encourage and love one another. And in all things, O Lord, may you receive all glory and honor and praise. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.